Good evening. Welcome to Speechless. I am Bob Zick, filling in for Tim Kinley tonight. And tonight, of course, is uh, July 25th, Thursday, 8 to 9 p.m. So the show is live, so feel free to call in with your questions or comment. And uh, I hope uh, I'm up to, oh, you know what? Well, let's start the show over again. <laughs> I, had, I had the mic on, and then I got up and uh, went into the control room. <laughs> All right. So I'm your host, Bob Zick, filling in for Tim Kinley. And to, tonight is July 25th, 8 to 9 p.m. If you're watching the show and you want to contribute with your questions or comments, feel free to call in. I believe the uh, number is up on the screen, 651-747-3838. And I hope I'm up to uh, Tim's standard. We're going to uh, deviate from my normal show, the material I, I cover, local government and what local government is doing to you, the citizens. And that was last night uh, live, same station. And uh, so, we will move on here, and uh, I'm, I'm going to start. We, we have a, a cartoon tonight, too, and then we have a uh, piece from today's paper and uh, about one of the attorneys that uh, I've worked with, well, Tim has worked with, and then we're going to get into a long segment. Some, of course, we have video on some police brutality and a really bad officer from what I see from this video, um, an officer Bergstad, and this is all gonna be, be uh, um, laid out for you. Uh, this guy is, is, if anybody gives the police a bad name, it's this guy. And also involved in some of the stuff we're gonna present tonight is Chief John Bannock, uh, now retired, you know, retired at 90% age of, I think John went at 51. Of course, John, uh, in my assessment, is a criminal in his own right. Uh, he beat uh, my cameraman, he was part of that, he beat me, and, and his reward for that was to be promoted to uh, assistant chief and then on to police chief in Crystal. So we're going to lay some of this, this out for you. To start with, though, came across this cartoon, uh, some of the many things that get e emailed to me, and I thought this one warranted sharing with you. So let's pull this one up. And let's, uh, I don't have a copy of it on the desk. The hypocrisy of a government that requires every citizen to prove they are insured, but not everyone must prove they are a citizen. Isn't that wonderful? And, and now, any of those who refuse or are unable to prove they are citizens will receive free insurance paid for by those who are forced to buy insurance because they are citizens. So. Let's think about that with uh, Obamacare. And, uh, you know, uh, what, what is the, the figure now? Um, he's approaching 60% of the people that are against this. And uh, if you're a young person, you absolutely ought to be against this because you're going to, in the good government way, subsidize all the people that have Bad, abuse themselves, have bad health, uh, that are at the end of their time, senior citizens, and now they want a further shift. You know, the seniors are leaving you a $17 trillion debt right now, and that's only going to get, get larger and larger. And uh, we figured that out a day. If you took $17,000 trillion and turned it into seconds, and I would encourage everybody do this. Take, take uh, 
60 seconds in a, in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, uh, uh, 52 days in a year, or 365 days in a year, um, and, and work that calculation out in, into seconds. And uh, I think the figure was something like uh, uh, 400,000 years, some astronomical figure. So you get a sense of the debt and how much you owe. And that's only federal debt. That doesn't count the county debt, the uh, uh, school district debt, the city debt, the state debt. And that doesn't include the annual expenditure of all those units of government. School, school district, 600 million county over 600 million, your city of St. Paul, um, printer 600 million, and then add in the debt and then add in your national debt. And so uh, it's one more load put on the backs of, of the young people. Doesn't include unfunded mandates for retirement. <laughs> doesn't, unfu doesn't include unfunded mandates for retirement? Which is, oh, that, that, that's correct. 200 trillion that's owed for the unfunded mandates for all these pensions that are out there for government and social security and so 200 trillion plus the 17 trillion. <laughs> Young people, my heart bleeds for you. Just keep, just keep voting for hope and change. Isn't this guy wonderful? Isn't he wonderful? We, we uh, on uh, Insight Insight, uh, a couple weeks ago, we did some of the things on Obama. And, you know, if, if uh, you don't think this is the devil incarnate after you, you see what he's responsible for. But he's got everybody, uh, you know, his, his hands are clean. He didn't know about it. He was staying back. And so when, when you watch this police brutality stuff that we're going to get into, and I want to kind of compare this with, with this brutality that, that the president and Eric Holder, the U.S. Attorney General, is trying to perpetrate on uh, uh, Zimmerman. The, uh, the, the press started out by calling him white and tried to, it, well, did make this a racial issue. And so then once it was determined that he was really Hispanic, they, uh, they the press and the president said that, well, he is uh, white Hispanic. Well, think about that. If George Zimmerman is white Hispanic, that makes the president white black. What is white black? If we have white Hispanics, do we have white blacks? Well, white blacks would be mulattoes, of course. So, you know, once they start twisting your mind, you have to step back and say, you know, these people have no goodwill uh, intentions, and they're out to harm me. Today's paper, there was a... Uh, inc a little article about this, uh, I think it was a two or three year old that was bitten by a skunk two or three times in the face. The child was in a little stroller outside. And uh, so the parent, and there were some other little children, ran in and got a gun and, and shot the skunk. A good thing that the person had a gun, of course. And then the skunk was because the skunk was now there, they were able to determine that the skunk, in fact, had rabies. But let's disarm our citizens so that when, when you are being assaulted, you cannot offend your, defend yourself. And when you see how this, the assault comes from police officers, the same thing that happened to myself, same thing that happened to the cameraman, but not to the degree as as this happens. And so this argument now about citizens being able to protect themselves, that's the first thing that our Constitution affords above everything else is the self-protection, self-preservation. And the government 
will not. Isn't it interesting that all these people that want to take away your guns, Obama and the Eric Holder, they all have armed bodyguards. Well, let's take the guns away from their bodyguards. They want to take them away from you. They don't want you to be able to defend yourself. But they'll come around and take a report after you're dead. Well, of course, you're not going to be able to give it. They'll ask for the video. <laughs> Folks, so, you know, one of the things, the discussion I heard was that now they're going after the jurors on the uh, uh, Mar Zimmerman Martin trial and trying to get them to say that, uh, you know, this was a travesty of justice, that he was really guilty. Well, what did he do? See, here's, here's the issue. People mix the term kill and murder. Well, he was guilty of killing Trayvon Martin, who, by the way, was, was beating him. And everything that's there shows that. And Trayvon was on, on the top, banging his head into the ground, breaking his nose. Trayvon's uh, uh, Facebook talked about how he liked to break people's noses and uh, her nose. And so, so the issue becomes when the juror says, well, he killed Trayvon. Yes, he killed Trayvon, but he didn't murder Trayvon. There's a difference between those two words. When you're in the military and you kill the enemy, they don't say you murdered the enemy. When you protect your family, you're not murdering somebody. You may kill them. When you have an accident and you, uh, with a car and you kill somebody, they don't say you murdered them. Murdered is with intention to have some kind of gain or uh, intention to, for, for self uh, reasons, but killing is a different thing. So people have to be able to understand the difference. And when we talk about the commandments, the real commandment is, thou sh it's, it is not, thou shall not kill. It is, thou shall not murder. All right, so now, when we get into the film tonight, there was another piece in today's paper, and uh, this is in Minneapolis, and the, the headline is, lawyer, lawyer Barred from Law Over Mental Health Issues. Now, the lawyer we're talking about here is uh, Jill Clark, and uh, Jill is an, is an attorney that ran for Minnesota Supreme Court. She ran twice, in 2008 and 2012, and uh, she ran for Chief Justice. Now, when I look at what the court's doing here, they're taking away her ability to, to make her her livelihood to, to have an income and they're keeping her from practicing law and I look at this and say it's in retaliation for running against sitting uh, Minnesota Supreme Court justices and uh, on, uh, to, to that end there's uh, Jill had, had uh, under so much pressure took a couple sabbaticals, and she was dealing with a lot of pressure, including uh, uh, she was the attorney for Patty Guerin uh, suing the city of Maplewood, where this, the Ma Maplewood uh, uh, police and housing inspectors broke down the door at Wipers Recycling and beat Patty Guerin in front of her employees and uh, we're told that the, uh, the city of Maplewood, well, actually the, the League of Minnesota Cities, who is the insurance company, that they had to give a settlement of a million, a million and a half. So that's another piece of, uh, that we need to get the exact number on, on that one. But in this case here, when you uh, confront the system, the system finds a way to come back at you. If you're part of the system, and that's what we're going to show with the police here, they'll cover up your brutality and your abuses. 
But if on the other hand you challenge the, the system, the system will find a way to harm you. And this is what they've done to Jill Clark now. This just came out. We were following this. We uh, worked with Jill Clark on several issues and of course supported her uh, in her uh, run for Minnesota uh, Supreme Court along with Greg Werthel. So uh, they're, they're charged that she was uh, unable to competently represent clients because of mental health issues. Yet she did a fine job. We had some of that tape here of going before the, the, uh, the state Supreme Court and defending herself in that matter, along with another attorney, Diana Longrey, uh, who represent Jill Clark. So in one hand, she's very competent to argue a case before the, the state Supreme Court, and then the su state Supreme Court turns around and takes away her livelihood. So that's what happens when you go up against the system. All right, let's now go into this. Uh, th this is about a cop uh, named Ber Burstad and uh, w Brooklyn Park and watch the video and we're going to periodically stop. We're going to show you the, the main, main incidents and then we're going to bring in some discussion about it and some other uh, issues with this same guy. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and run that, please. Um, we're gonna show you that video now. And I should mention that, before he gets that rolling, that copies of this video and the, as well, this video clip, as well as the full length version of all four squad cars that we got directly from Brooklyn Park, in other words, the raw footage, is on the jump drive that we have provided to you. Yes, if you would turn the dim, dim the lights, please. Andrew, they're behind you. Could you please dim the lights? Okay, there you go. Now he's grabbing him. And he starts to punch, and you can see through the window, punching, 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 over and over. Now you can see it from a different angle, from another squad car. Over and over and over. Okay, so that's again is the short clip of the video. That officer is Officer Burstad of the Brooklyn Park Police. Now, you notice how they, uh, on this video, and this video came, there was four squad cars that had cameras running that uh, filmed this. And so this footage that that's available is from I think it was 2006 and they finally got it the organization that is is doing this and I maybe we can put it up uh, 2007 and the uh, organization that's bringing this out and we're going to put it up on the screen communities united against police brutality and there will be a phone number and a website there for people that experience this kind of aggression by the the police, and uh, you know, when I watch this, this this officer is just a beast. Can you imagine the the person on the ground 
is to keep beating them like this. And then she's going to talk about the, uh, what happened to this person. You can't keep punching somebody in the head like that. And that officer is just a big, mean person as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, the, the fact that they, they blotted out the, the faces of other officers, shame on them. The other officers are just as guilty because they allowed it. They were there uh, and contributed. They were part of the crime. The same, same thing that the police do, do against citizens. You're an accessory to the crime. Well, those officers were accessories to the beating of that individual. Now, this is, is real brutality. This is where you have to be protected against the police. And then I'm going to read the police report from this lying officer. When I read this, all I can say is this guy is, is not only is a beater, but he's a liar. And so here, here's um, the officer's statement. You, you notice how when, they, when these officers write their report and how they, they lie about what actually went on? At the time, I did not pull, at the time, I did pull my squad car alongside the driver's side portion of the suspect's vehicle and attempted to stop Lee from running. I did exit my car and observed that AL was attempting to run northbound away from officers. No, he stood there and put his hands up. You saw it. Let's, I'm going to read the lie, the lie here. I, uh, I came around the front portion of my squad car and attempted to tackle him that's so he could not get away. He was running away. No, he wasn't. He, did he tackle him? No. He grabbed him around the neck and put him on the ground and started to beat him. I was giving him ner numerous verbal commands to cooperate and get down on the ground so that he could be taken into custody. Did that, is that what it looked like? Did you see verbal commands? Did you see the um, individual not complying? Did you see the individual uh, warrant the kind of beating that, that Officer uh, Berkstad uh, gave him. <sighs> A.L. was not cooperating, and I attempted to grab his arm and saw that Detective Zaret also attempted to grab his left arm. During the struggle to take control of A.L., I did receive minor injuries to my right knee <coughs> excuse me, and began struggling with A.L. Any injury... Any fake injury that this officer, Bergstad, received were of his own doing, his own uh, viciousness. Bergstad is, is the worst kind of officer you can imagine. I did receive minor injuries to my right kneecap and began struggling with AL to get him to the ground. It should be noted at this time, I was stuck between my car and the suspect's vehicle in, in tight quarters in attempting to get AL into custody. I was able to physically wrestle and fright fight L to the ground and attempted to handcuff Lee. No, he attempted to murder him. He attempted to beat him to death. Wait until you, you, you hear what, what, what the officer suffered as a consequence. You know, when Eric Holder, the U.S. Uh, Attorney General, wants to go after Zimmerman for protecting himself from some guy that's on top of him beating him for, for uh, 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 racial profiling and uh, violations of, of uh, civil rights, why, don't, why doesn't he really do something rewarding and go after this officer? Uh, it should be noted that I gave A.L. numerous commands to cooperate and put his hands behind his back, but he was not responding. <laughs> oh, he was unconscious. 
I beat him unconscious and he wasn't responding, so I had to keep beating him. <laughs> Can you imagine? Let's play the video and uh, watch the discussion from the organization um, Communities United Against Police Brutality. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michelle Gross and I am the president of Communities United Against Police Brutality, a community organization in the Twin Cities that addresses um, issues of police brutality, misconduct and abuse of authority. And we are here today to talk to you a little bit about the situation in Brooklyn Park um, with an officer by the name of uh, Sergeant Gregory Burstad. Um, officer Burstad was involved with the Metro Gang Strike Force, but has been an officer in uh, Brooklyn Park for some time and has caused, frankly, quite a lot of problems for people in Brooklyn Park. We're going to compare and contrast his situation, however, with two officers with the Crystal Police Department who have had exemplary careers and who um, unfortunately are facing retaliation as a result of their complaints about Officer Burstad. We're, their situations weren't really addressed. And further, not one single officer was disciplined as a result of the gross misconduct that was involved in the, in the Metro Gang Strike Force. So for that reason, people felt uncomfortable. They felt dissatisfied. They wanted to be able to take this further. And so they came to our organization asking us to file complaints on their behalf. We ended up in all filing 31 complaints um, against, uh, on behalf of 30 people against Officer Burstad. The um, stack of paper that you had conversated together and knew each other, these were complaints of people who had just run into Officer Burstad and had v various incidents with Officer Burstad over a period of time and, again, didn't necessarily know each other, compare notes, or any such thing as that. The allegations that we filed were frankly appalling. Um, again, I mentioned that quite a number of these allegations were involved in the Metro Gang Strike Force class action lawsuit. Just the allegations and the complaints we filed that were sustained in that lawsuit cost the taxpayers well over $200,000. Um, what got our attention as we began to look at these cases is that Sergeant Greg Burstead was at the center of these things over and over and over again. This is a, this first example is of a gentleman, um, a young man, an uh, African American man, who was involved in an, uh, in an incident in which um, he was uh, assaulted. He was he he had been part of a, a, a low speed chase essentially, um, but at the but after a few blocks he gave up, got out, put his hands in the air, surrendered. You can't be any more compliant than surrendering. He surrendered. And instead of giving the other officer who was starting to put his hand behind his back to handcuff him, instead of giving that opportunity, Burstad attacked him from the side, punching him over and over and over viciously. We counted in the video over 20 punches to his head. And as we know from the, the, the Clifton case, Punches to the head can be very devastating injuries or even deadly. And so this gentleman experienced over 20 punches to the head. Um, he, as a result, he had, he had serious injuries. When you watch this and you see this, is this civil rights violation? Is this the, the police state, the power of the state against an in, individual? This, this is racial uh, profiling, racial beating at its worth. worth. And uh, when, when, what else is, is worse than this? When you see what goes on here. And this police officer, I, I see paperwork here that he got a, a, a five day suspension, a 40 hour suspension suspension <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> folks <laughs> what do you feel about this let's call in what do you think about this and uh, we have more more video this, this isn't all this guy did this guy uh, 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 beat and arrested a person and, and then um, according to the paperwork here cleaned out their house of all their valuables. This guy has, what did it say here, 31 complaints against him? And the most he gets out of it, 
31 complaints filed. Files starting in uh, uh, 8 22 12. 30 courageous people came forward, signed complaints, filed with Brooklyn Park PD, FBI, Minnesota Post Board. And see, the, the problem with this is these officers are investigated by the system. And the system has an inherent duty to protect each other. That's that, that code of silence. And then you get uh, police chiefs like John Bannock that, and we, wonder, we wondered if, if John uh, Bannock retired about, over some of the stuff that was going on in Crystal. You know, I, I have nothing good to say about these people. All right, let's play some more, more video. We have a piece here where, where uh, was it KSTP, the Channel 5, uh, finally picked up a piece on this. You know, we had this a couple weeks ago, and so try to get this out so some of the other media picks up on it. I talked about this a couple weeks ago on the show, and so it's the effort. You know, can you imagine the, the press that, that uh, uh, Trayvon Martin case, was? they were trying to gin up um, the, the, the racial divide be, between uh, whites and blacks and Hispanics and Asians and uh, and it goes on and on. So the press tries to do that and then yet when there's a real travesty here, where is this in the press? All right, let's uh, let's play the uh, play the piece. This traffic and, uh, stop years ago might be coming back now to haunt a Brooklyn Park police officer. Video is being released tonight by a local watchdog group. They're claiming that the one week suspension that this officer served in June was not punishment enough for this incident or others. And Five Witness News reporter Ellen Gallus has the video tonight. The cameras were rolling on June 15th, 2007 during this traffic stop in Brooklyn Park. The officer you see striking the suspect is Sergeant Greg Burstead. Michelle Gross with Communities Against Police Brutality says he struck the suspect repeatedly, even after his hands were up in surrender. She's got this video and a stack of complaints against Burstead and some of his superiors that she's filed with local departments and with the FBI. We understand that police officers have to use force, reasonable force, but there is nothing reasonable about battering and beating a man who has already submitted, has already held his hands up, he's surrendered. The Brooklyn Park Police Department has also examined this video. The department told us it spent nine months investigating 106 potential policy violations against Burstead. Eight of them had merit. Even still, he was placed on a one-week suspension last month. He has since returned to work. The department also released this statement saying several years have passed since Burstead was involved in the failures outlined in the investigation. He has since helped our department develop gang reduction and youth violence prevention efforts that have been progressive, well-managed, and professionally competent. In Brooklyn Park, Ellen Gallus, Five Eyewitness News. We were unable to reach Sergeant Burstead for a comment on this story. No one ever filed a complaint against the department or Burstead in this case. The watchdog group brought it to police attention. This may not be the last time, though, the last we hear on this case. The Minnesota Post Board for Police Training and Standards is also investigating this matter now. Well, 106 violations, and all they could confirm was eight. <laughs> do, you have, do, you, do you have any faith? in uh, this system? Can, can you, I mean, you watch the video and, and uh, the, the liars twist and turn and say, oh, well, you know, uh, you injured that, that young man for life. Um, maybe you were uh, just a little over the top, uh, slightly uh, uh, carried away. You know, instead of punching him 20 times in the head um, when he was unconscious, um, you probably should have stopped at maybe 10 or 15. Is that their rationale? This guy shouldn't be on the police force. This guy should, sh and the department should be paying for the young man that they abused. I don't care 
what the young man did, arrest him, and that's what our court system is, is for. That's what our court system was for in the Zimmerman uh, Martin trial. And when the jury finds him not guilty, that's our system. But we don't have the police decide, well, we don't like this person and uh, we get to beat him as, as much as we want. And then we get to go and write a, our, our phony report saying that uh, it was the person's fault that we're just a mean, rotten, uh, vicious officer that shouldn't be out on the street. And then you see the, the, uh, the police department say, oh, this is a wonderful officer. Um, you know, he, uh, he, he helped an old lady across the uh, uh, street. And so he's entitled to, to beat people unconscious. Let's play some more of what happened to this, this person. So that, again, is the short clip of the video. We have provided both that as well as the longer version to you. We understand that police officers have to use force, reasonable force, but there is nothing reasonable about battering and beating a man who has already submitted, has already held his hands up, he surrendered. There is no reasonable use of force in a situation like that whatsoever. So that's you know part of our very big concern. Now the other piece of our concern is this, Brooklyn Park Police Department had this video, we got it from them. They have had this video the entire time since this incident occurred. Now I wanna show you something else. Minnesota Statute 609.223 is uh, essentially assault in the third degree, felony assault in the third degree. The elements of this, um, of this crime are that it is intentional and that it inflicts substantial bodily harm. And we believe that what Officer Burstad did meets these criteria absolutely. So let me show you how. Again, we know that the assault was clearly intentional. Um, the substantial bodily harm that um, this individual uh, received, you know, was, uh, was, was again, not, not unsubstantial. He had um, significant soft tissue injury, injuries to his face. He also had his tooth broken off. You know, this is a, um, a young man who is an attractive young man. He's in a, you know, young, youth, young age of his life where he's out dating and, and those kinds of things. And um, this is an embarrassing daily reminder to this young man of his encounter with Officer Burstad. He has a broken tooth. It's been repaired, um, but the repair came off because these teeth are very difficult. It's hard to fix a front tooth. And it's always there. It's always a reminder to him of his encounter. The injuries were so bad, in fact, that day that he was actually transported to the hospital. Keep in mind that the officer is acting under the color of law. And that's really the civil rights violation. I'm going to keep going back to the, the Zimmerman, Trayvon Martin thing, that Zimmerman wasn't acting under the color of law. But in this case, Berkstad was under the color of law. That makes this so much more horrendous. That's what really the crime is about. Let's keep playing this. Listen to what, what's being discussed here. In addition, in this same incident, um, Officer Burstad lied extensively in his police report. Many different lies that we outline, saying that he got out of his car and observed that the individual was trying to run. Not true. You saw it for yourselves. The individual took one step to the left and then stopped. He attempted to tackle him so he could not get away. Well, it was pretty clear he wasn't attempting to tackle anything he was attempting to beat his face in. The individual was not cooperating, yet another lie because you can see that he has surrendered. I was struggling to take control of him. Well, the other officer who we now know as Officer Zaret didn't seem to have any issues about taking control of him. He had his arm out, he was ready to bring it behind his back and there was no issues of control at that point. I gave him numerous commands to put his hands behind his back, but he was not responding. Well, unfortunately, the video we got has no sound on it, so we can't know if he was saying anything or not. You couldn't see him saying anything, 
but it is possible that he was saying things. But listen, when you're getting your face beat in, I don't think the thing you're going to do is stand there and you know just put your hands behind your back when you're being tousled about and getting your face beat in. It is human nature to try to protect your face. And um, the individual that we that we worked with on this case, he said that all other officers were holding his hands down so he couldn't even defend his own face. So even if um, Burstad had been telling him to do something with his arms, he wouldn't have been able to because the other officers were pinning his arms down. And finally, there is no mention in his police report whatsoever. And by the way, you have this report on your job. Going with this, when you watch the uh, Channel 5 KSTP report, that report or that reporter didn't talk about the depth or the heinousness of what this officer did, this, this uh, uh, Burstad, and what the other officers allowed to happen. And so that's really the, the big crime that's here. Civil rights violation, um, police brutality, the worst is right here. And so as somebody like George Zimmerman, who was the, his, the jury found him innocent, and well, okay, let's say the, the jury found that there was no evidence that he was guilty. Technical difference between declaring him innocent and finding no guilt. In this case, but Zimmerman will be tarnished for life. This officer gets a 40-hour suspension. His life goes on. Where is this guy? Where is this guy, the real brutalizer? And let's get into some of the other things that this officer has done. Let's play some more on this guy drives there is no mention of in that police report whatsoever any of these punches you must must document use of force in your reports there is no mention of this force in this report second example we took a complaint and we had many complaints that looked like this when you go through all of the complaints you just can't believe the number of times you see this recurring theme some Latino males were walking down a sidewalk or a street. You know, they're just minding their own business. Um, Burstad pulls up on them or another officer. And in this case, it was another officer and said, come here, come here, I want to talk to you. And when they didn't immediately respond, he called Burstad, who came over to the scene. And um, the man was, um, one of the young, four young men was basically being given a lesson about the need to cooperate whenever we feel like telling you to cooperate because they handcuffed him and severely beat him. Then, in Burstad's report, he says that all four of the males were released on the scene. That is an absolute lie. This individual was taken into the Brooklyn Park Police Department. This young teen was taken to the Brooklyn Park Police Department forcibly. He was questioned for hours on end, and literally there is no record of this abduction. It is as if this young man for several hours just disappeared. Something that you might see in Central America, but not here in Minnesota. The third example that we want to talk about is Burstad's repeated attempts to frame people up. We got multiple complaints from people that Burstad would communicate with them and either threaten them if they did not find him guns and plant them on people or would you know try to entice them with money or offers to allow them to commit crimes in Brooklyn Park un unmolested these kinds of things he would endlessly harass people for information he would call people on their personal cell phones over and over even after they had told him stop communicating with me stop bothering me and if they tried not to give him the information then they were threatened with their families being deported um, they would, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, their families being deported, they were threatened with being brutalized, they had guns held to their heads, all kinds of situations where either they were trying to be enticed to frame up other people or give information on other people. Many incidents like that. Again, you'll see those on your jump drive. The last incident I want to talk about is a case with a, a, a family called the Ramirez family. This family had a home in Crystal at the time and um, on D July 29, 2008, the, the only people that were home was the grandfather, Norberto, and 
the, his son, um, Adrian. Adrian came out onto the front lawn, burst out, tackled him to the ground, handcuffed him, took his keys out of his pocket, walked up to the door, used the keys, and attempted to walk in. No warrant. When the door had a chance we get into this case, uh, Burstad would, would use force against these people to commit perjury against other individuals. This officer has no limits to how he abuses people. He uses, the, once again, the, the color of, of the police state to work his harm against individuals to threaten them, whether it's with deportation or physical beating or putting a gun to their head. This guy is evil. All right, let's get into the case we're working on right now on it. He kicked the door down so hard that it came off the hinges. It knocked Norberto down. Then they walked in the house, burst out or another one of the officers with him, stepped on Norberto's head so hard that it broke his tooth out by the root. And this is a, a, an elderly gentleman. For Adrian, he was taken away, put into jail for seven days. Now understand that Brooklyn Park uh, jail is a two-day facility. He was essentially disappeared for seven days. He wasn't even signed in. And he stayed disappeared for seven days. His family did not know where he was for a good bit of that time. And while that was happening, the family was dispossessed of their home. The, the lock was changed at Burstad's direction. He had the key to the house, and he admits as much on a tape. And while the house was under his control, all of the family's possessions were stolen. He told the family, come on Friday at noon and I'll let you back in your house. They arrived at 11 o'clock to see a truck driving away with all of their possessions. So essentially, we're talking felony theft here. Now, after submitting all of this overwhelming evidence and documentation, 31 complaints of numerous dozens of allegations, and you can see what those complaints look like. After submitting all of that, this is what we got back. One little piece of paper. And that piece of paper is a memo saying essentially that they only sustained, the Brooklyn Park Police Department police chief only sustained a handful of the... In, in the case where the, they made the individual disappear for, for seven days in a two-day facility, without charging him, there's, under our Constitution, it's called habeas corpus, produce the body. What, the civil rights violation by this guy and the Brooklyn Park Police Department is, is, un, is horrendous, it's horrendous. Uh, they're beating blacks, they're beating Hispanics, they're taking away people's constitutional rights. And they get a, listen to what she says here, a 40-hour suspension? Folks. <laughs> and, and, and the uh, Congress just voted that the uh, uh, government can, can monitor your phone calls and keep an eye on you because you're a threat. Who's a threat? The police are the threat. The government's the threat. Your rights and liberties are going away. They're disappearing. All right, let's play some more of this. We're going to run out These of allegations. time. These allegations. The punishment, 40 hours of suspension. Now, that might sound like a significant punishment because we know that police in Minnesota with the various agencies do not get disciplined very often, but it is nowhere near commensurate with the acts of Burstad. And these acts, frankly, are criminal. It is nowhere near adequate for what he has done. Under the Minnesota Post Board rules, frankly, Burstad should not even be having a police license. We are working with the Post Board because we insist that they take a look at his license. We absolutely insist on it. He should not even be a police officer at this point. To quote the Post Board further, 
The board believes that in order for the public to have confidence in the integrity and ability of law enforcement, it is paramount that police officers demonstrate that they are capable of self-regulation. I think it's clear that Burstead lacks the ability to self-regulate and he lacks honesty and integrity. He should not be a police officer. Meanwhile in Crystal, the Ramirez family, having had all of their, per their possessions stolen from them, reported the crime as anyone else would to the Crystal Police Department. And then they waited and they checked with the Crystal Police Department and they waited and they checked and they waited and they checked, trying to get the police department in Crystal to investigate this case. No investigation beyond the original um, complaint document. That, and that was uh, John Bannock, police chief of, uh, uh, be beater of the press, John Bannock, beater of the press and, and Chief Tamala uh, Dave Tamala of Maplewood, beater of the press. You know, never apologize. Uh, use the system to cover up your, your deeds. And, you know, it's, well, is this one bad officer? Or is it the bad officers that allow this to happen? And, you know, here's, here's a couple statements that from two officers that did come forward and report other officers, and then the consequences of the retaliation against them for bringing these kind of, of officers exposing this. Something's wrong with this. Something's wrong with this. We have too much of a police state. City of North St. Paul, one constable when I was a kid, City of North St. Paul hasn't gotten any larger. It's still about the same, what is it, three miles square? <laughs> now you have 18 officers? Wow, what a police state. Think of what that cost. And these guys all can retire at, what, age 50 and get 90% of their salary? We have to stop this. And the pensions. We're going broke. We can't afford this. All right, let's, let's keep going on with this. The, the, the original offense document was ever committed, you know, uh, happened in Crystal. No whatsoever, not one single bit of investigation was ever done on this incident. It appears strongly that this is because Burstad is a cop with another agency and because Burstad was part of the Metro Gang Strike Force. It, it clearly looks like that's the reason why. We attempted to get Crystal to investigate this case. We scheduled three separate meetings with Ann Norris, the city manager for the city of Crystal. She canceled all three of those meetings at the last minute and then sent a memo saying, I will never meet with you. I'm not going to meet with you or the family. So then we started a series of demonstrations and speaking out at city council meetings in Crystal. During this time, Chief John Bannock, who had been the chief during the incident, the Ramirez incident, quickly retired the day before the Metro Gang Strike Force findings were to come out in public. He quickly retired and went away. One of his cronies, Stephanie Revering, became the chief. A number of Crystal Police officers have expressed great concern about working in a department in which this kind of nonsense can go on. They were very offended by it. They did not want to be part of, an, of a police agency that wouldn't investigate. So they stepped forward and they complained. Two of the officers are, um, that we consider to be whistleblowers are, um, are, have come to us and asked us to, to assist them in taking their complaints further. Because as a result of their complaints, both have been severely retaliated against. I want to make it clear that their complaints were not just about the Ramirez incidents, though they both raised these incidents to either to the city council or to the city manager. They also raised other incidents of corruption in, within the police administration. The first officer that I want to talk about is um, Sergeant Robin Erkenbrock. He has been a 27-year veteran of the Crystal Police Department. He's been decorated many times. He does not have one single complaint against him from the community. We call that a good cop, and we like to support good cops and good policing. Yet, Reverend has gone after him with a vengeance. Um, it is just terrible. She has placed him on leave. She has demoted him, and she tried to force him into retirement. When he wouldn't take the retirement, she threatened further retaliation. 
This is because, frankly, he knows things about her. She was involved in betting a bottle of booze with another, um, off with another officer about when a newly hired police officer would be fired. She was in charge of training at the time, so she would know when he was going to be coming on board. That, by the way, I should tell you that this happened before the officer had even actually been officially hired. She knew when he would be coming on board, and she knew when she would be working with him, and she engineered his firing. As a result, that officer, um, Michael Keller, received a big pile of money from the city of Crystal um, in, you know, as a result of this incident. Yet, Stephanie Rebering was never disciplined. The, the internal affairs investigation found no misconduct. She freely admits she betted. We have a document that proved it. And yet, no, no discipline whatsoever. Revering and a couple of other individuals went to a strip club in their off hours. It's legal, maybe not the most savory activity, but it is legal. But they got drunk at the strip club. They caused a ruckus at the strip club because they got into an altercation with uh, another individual they recognized from Crystal. And the strip club manager had to walk them out and then raised um, complaints with the Crystal Police Department. Sergeant Erkenbrock ordered that the, the person on duty take the complaint and treat it like a regular complaint. This, of course, did not sit well with Reverend at all. And at her first opportunity when she was appointed to be the police chief, she immediately took retaliation for that as well. And again, um there's more of this. Here's, here's the little, you can't see it here, but this is the uh, uh, little note where they, uh, where they bet on how soon they could get this other officer fired. Uh, Stefan says May 20th, this is back in 2006. Uh, Stephanie, uh, Jerry says July 4th. Uh, Keller, Keller let, let go bet. Close, closest to termination date, wins bottle of booze. So isn't it wonderful how they can f figure out how, how to get rid of people? The, the issue here, and I'm your host, Bob Zick, filling in for Tim Kinley, and Tim is out in the state of Washington. I think he's doing some investigative reporting, and he'll be back next week. But these officers like John Bannock and Dave Tamala, uh, what is their standing in the community? Shouldn't these people suffer more than somebody like George Zimmerman, who, who was protecting his own life instead of uh, beating up the press, in, instead of covering up these police brutalities? Um, they're rewarded. They're rewarded with promotions. They're rewarded with, with big pensions. Thank you, and uh, I appreciate filling in for Tim. Have a good night. We'll be Tim will be back next week. Stay strong.